I'm so excited. I'm really excited about this. I'm, I'm super excited too. So Melissa, you, I've known Melissa for, I don't know how long have I known you, like three, four years, yeah. something like that? 2010, yeah. yeah. It's, it's amazing. Melissa was really, uh, one of, she and Molly were instrumental in bringing me to Bloomington, Indiana to teach, and I so had a wonderful time there. That, in fact, that class that I taught in Indiana holds the world's record for the highest chocolate consumption <laughs> in any of my classes. And really and truly, we were walking to the store like once or twice a day to, to reload <laughs> to, in order to have enough chocolate to make the class go. So it was, so, but I also remember what wonderful women I met in Indiana and how, what a great time I had. And uh, you started talking to me about this idea that you mm -hmm. had for this, like what, a year ago? Something like yeah. that, a long time. And, and I'm super duper excited. Because like somewhere along the line you said like, well, it's just kind of, it's not a full idea yet. You know, it's kind of half-baked. And, and I said, no, no, this is awesome. Because you're really onto something. And, and you're going to get some input from the other people in the room. Mm -hmm. and, and if it's, if it, you know, if there's like 1% like of it that's still unbaked, it's going to get baked today. So I'm, I'm super excited. And I think that what, what you're going to present is a book. And, and so I totally love you, Melissa, and, I, and so take it away. I right. want to know about Empowered VBAC. All right. Great, great. So I have a little bit of housekeeping before we start, and that is hold your questions until the end, like ride this wave with me today, because I've created a model, and you're going to plug into the model, and it's going to make sense as we move through this time together. Um, the other thing is, is that we are talking about vaginal birth after cesarean birth, and that is culturally loaded. We're all human, so we've all been born, and a lot of us are mothers in this room, and some or many of us may be holding on to some of those birth wounds from birthing our own children. And that makes talking about VBAC really difficult. So I'm asking you to step into your practitioner mode and do what you do to ground yourself when you know a client's coming in with a heavy story so that you can get ready to receive the information that I'm giving you. Because we can't change culture until we name what is out of balance and culture. And we're gonna do a lot of naming today. So just take a moment, take a deep breath. Whatever you do, Sunshine came over and grounded me earlier. That was some good stuff. So ground and get ready to receive. All right, we're gonna go. We're gonna do this. Let's see here, I've gotta get my orientation. Here's my sweet niece, Amelia. She was a VBAC baby, born in 2013. And today, let's just start with this, this quote, and you can go, hmm, childbirth is an intimate and complex transi transaction whose topic is physiological and whose language is cultural. Every community has its own culture of childbirth. So just because we're birthing in America doesn't mean that there aren't variations within each community on that culture, okay? So this is priming us to start thinking about how birth goes down in our communities. So I have, um, I have an essential question to start out with, and that's how we as practitioners empower women to prepare for VBAC, okay? Even planning, even saying, I'm going to do this. For some women, it starts out, I'm going to try to do this. I would like to do this. How are we a container for that, okay? Just to keep us concrete, I have very specific goals today. We're gonna to consider our national and our local birth cultures. We're going to examine and discuss a model for empowering, treating, and teaching our clients by taking a broad view of each woman's 
journey towards v VBAC, and that model is called a model for empowered VBAC, or as Carol said, it started out as Melissa's half-baked idea. Pre we're going to practice plugging into the model because for me, it's so important that you walk out of this room, and if you had a VBAC client come in tomorrow, a woman planning a VBAC tomorrow in your office, you would have something to work with. All right, we're going to talk about strategies and support within the client session, within the community, and possibly within the labor because that started to be some of my work to go in during labor, early labor to help real mom in and get her in bed so she's resting and not spinning out and getting too excited so that she can shore up her energy for when the real work of labor starts to happen. And I also go in um, at times if there's been a home birth to hospital transport or that time when mom goes to the hospital and it's really tough getting to the hospital if she's planning a hospital birth going from her cozy home into the hospital. And I go in and I help reel her in and be that therapeutic presence for her so that she can make good empowered choices. Okay. And so what I would like to know is how many of you are working with moms right now in your practice? Okay. And how many people are working with babies but not moms? Okay. All right. It's so good to know. So, you know, we all know that how we birth is important and it has an impact on the baby. So we've got that, that tie that binds us here. All right. So I have to... I know what my local scene is, but before um, I start to judge my local scene, I want to see how it, uh, it, it stacks up to the national scene. Okay, so I'm going to let you look at those statistics. And I'm not a statistician, but I bounce these numbers off. I talked to a lot of women putting this together. I talked to lots of doulas and midwives. I talked to a couple of medical anthropologists. I talked to lots of clients, um, some who did not get to have their VBACs that had a second cesarean birth, and a lot of women who did get to have their VBACs. So what I know is that um, according to this number, in 1965, Cesarean birth rates were low, very, very low, and that's consistent with the World Health Organization's suggestion for the number of actually, like, medical necessary births. We're looking at about 5%, but our national rate is always hovering about, like, 30%, which tells me that 25% of women are having unnecessary cesarean births, okay? So we're going to talk about how that goes down. Um, not, this blew me away. 90% of women are eligible for a VBAC. I thought that was really high. I like that number, though. 90%? Like 90% are eligible? I love that number. OK, so I know the national scene. So then I have to know what's going down in my local scene, because I have to know when a mom comes in, what she have to work with or what does she have to work against. OK, so at my local hospital, we're at about that 30 percent. We're 28 percent. Half of those are repeat cesarean births. 15 percent of the hospital birth mothers who plan for VBAC so that's not in the ballpark of 90%. Only 15% are. Even if that stat was wrong and only like 50% were eligible for a VBAC, in my town only 15% of hospital birth moms are planning a VBAC. And then 70% of those are successful. So I do my eighth grade math and I realize, whoa, only 10% of women are having VBACs at my local hospital. In my community, 44% of all birthing women are induced or augmented with Pitocin. It's high. And formal stats about VBAC and home birth, they're not available because of the legal status uh, of midwifery in Indiana. So in the 90s, when I had my, um, my home birth VBACs, um, there was no backup, and my midwives were felons. And of course, that varies from state to state. So my fear on a transport was that CPS was going to come in if I transported. We had no backup. 
Okay, so that's huge in my birth culture. Okay, now that um, midwives are legal in the state of Indiana, and this is the certified professional midwives. This are, these are the direct entry midwives. The nurse midwives have been able to work in my local hospital. Okay, but what we're concerned about um, is that now that there is a governing board for licensure for our certified professional midwives in Indiana, is that they're going to lose their freedom in their practice. So it may be illegal for them to take the home birth VBACs. So as a body worker, as a healer, as a practitioner, as a woman who loves women and babies, <laughs> I've got to see what I can do to make those hospital births happen, those hospital VBACs happen. That's one of my passions, right? Because I can't, um, you know, we can't toss it on the midwives anymore. They're going to be on the radar. My friend Mary Helen Ayers is the president of the Indiana Midwives Association, and she uh, is going, they have a fall conference, and it's going to be about VBAC specifically, which is great. It means like these women are not going to roll over on this. They are going to put forward a plan plan of action. But when women come into my office right here, right now, I have to look at what they have to deal with. Okay. So there's my local climate. Additionally, I need to know who my clients are. So I know the five midwives who practice in my community, and I know the t how they practice, and two of them very consistently send me clients. And then I get a lot of clients who choose um, an obstetrician who is our home birth backup, and he was trained out of the country, so he has a totally different skill set than the other obstetricians in the town. General practitioners are not allowed to catch babies in my town. You have to be an OB or a nurse midwife supervised by an OB. I know, right? So, and I forgot because I met some family practitioners here and I was like, this is a crime, this isn't happening in my town, right? So my sense of what's going on locally shifted, all right? So, I also get a group, <laughs> I have to make myself laugh because if I don't laugh, I'll tap out and I won't want to do this anymore. I have a group of women who come to me from a practice that I like to call the bad boyfriend practice. And the bad boyfriend practice talks a really good talk about VBAC, but as the labor progresses, the mom gets the bait and switch. And I don't think that that's intentional on a good day. Um, I feel like um, that practitioner, they're just working within their dogma and their training and they want what's best for mom and baby, whether I agree with that or not. And so moms get the bait and switch. So if you turn over, these are the quotes. These are like the, the quotes when I talk to the moms. These are the ones that popped out for me that I wanted to share with you. So Alita says, at 32 weeks, I was told that I had a big baby and a small pelvis. We've heard that story before, right? That's a familiar one. You feel like you are looked at under a microscope for something to be wrong. Okay, so here's another one, number three. The same OB who told me she would, she would cheer me on with my VBAC every step of the way was the same woman who told me to stop crying as they wheeled me to the, or to the operating room. Okay, so she didn't get, just get the bait and switch, she got an emotional hook and jab to boot. Okay? So mom's practitioner can talk very supportively about VBAC, but when things start to go down, things change. And then this mom ends up with a practitioner that she doesn't trust anymore. And those are the hands that her child are being born into. And I have a problem with that, right? And so do moms, okay? So the bait and switch, the hook and jab, and the bad boyfriend, these are all within my model. So let's take a look at it. And you've got the model. You've got the model in front of you. I'll be happy to put this on like the downloadable thing for you so you can have a colored one. What I want you to know is that it's like bi-directional, so it's not a hierarchy. Even though a lot of people choose their childbirth um, paradigm first, it's not the one that's necessarily on top, okay? So when I had my babies, 
or my first baby, which was a cesarean birth, I had a cultural view that pulled me towards a certain childbirth paradigm that responded in a way that was not conducive to physiological childbirth. And they responded in that way because I had some biological realities. And one of the bio biological realities is that I have posterior babies and that they, I need to have four or five days of stop and start labor every night, and then my uterus rests and my baby rests, and they need to move slowly. Now, at this point in the game, I've got skills to help moms with that so they don't have to live that, right? To help them get that baby rotated faster. And hopefully if they've worked with me, we're not even going to have posterior babies. Or if we have posterior babies, they're going to rotate much more quickly. And mom doesn't go into her labor on four days of not sleeping because a VBAC mom has another baby most likely, right? She's got a baby that she has to take care of at home or another child or she's working so it's not like if she has like a night of labor and it craps out at 3 p.m. or 3 a.m. she's got to get up and go to work because she has limited maternity leave or she's got to get up and take care of, of, of another child okay so for me I had a cultural view that drove me to a certain type of childbirth paradigm that didn't respond well to my biological reality, which was I needed movement and gravity and time. Okay? So that's where I'm going with this. On your model, you've got mom in the middle. Okay? And so I'm not going there yet, but with mom in the middle, so in all of this, middle part here, that is her emotional and a spiritual experience within this container. And so depending on the type of healer you are, you may deal with that emotional and spiritual aspect of her wellness, or you might refer out, um, but this is the container, okay? So... I gave myself one slide that I get to be silly. Okay, so I was reading, I was trying to figure out about five years ago, how am I a healer that like leans on the side of woo woo, but also has like great reverence for science. And I was reading this book called Kepler's Witch. It's a biography of Johannes Kepler. 16th century astronomer who back then as a scientist he had to fund his scientific endeavors by making money as an astrologer and I thought that was really interesting right so like in his model his that like the container in which he worked it was like religion did not exist without metaphysics, and metaphysics did not exist without science, and science did not exist without religion. And I was like, whoa, wow, what a container to work within. And I started to think about, well, what's my container I work within based on the cultural times, you know, the time I'm here on this earth. And then I start thinking about my, my moms, you know, what's their container for their childbirth experience? And that's how this kind of came to be. And so you've heard me talk about the bad boyfriend. I used to work inpatient psychiatric care and I facilitated women's groups. And I had this flashback to sitting in women's groups in inpatient psych when I was like at a community-based um, you know, center and women were talking about planning for their VBACs. And the moms started saying like, if only I do something different Dr. So-and-so won't treat me this way. If only I do this, this won't happen. Maybe if I lose some weight, I won't get treated this way. I won't have that same cesarean birth. And I thought, whoa, this sounds like the conversation that was opening up. It sounded like the abused women who make excuses for the lover or the partner who is emotionally or physically abusing them. And I was like, whoa, how we choose our caregivers when we're planning a VBAC is very culturally loaded. Okay, I'm gonna give you a minute to breathe that in. 
So then another mom pops up, and she's, 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 she, she had her VBAC. And she said, well, I stuck with the same practice, even though they steered me wrong the first time, because I, know, I knew how to manipulate them. I was, so the message, I was already familiar with the abuse, so I could work with them. I knew how to work around them. And I say all the time that I believe that when we hear these bad birth stories where it wasn't that 5%, that woman was not that woman that medically needed that cesarean birth. And I say that with a lot of reverence because now we're in a culture where if you know you have to have a cesarean birth, and I talk to moms in this situation, you get judged because you're not going for your VBAC. Well, whose business is that? You, you may be that one of the 5%. You know, or maybe you just, that's the way you want to do it, and the shame has got to die away. And that's part of the cultural problem, right? So if a mom is like one of that 5% and she has the, the, the planned cesarean birth, what about everybody else? What are they buying into? What are their, their barriers to planning this? Okay. Oh, so, yeah, I thought, how culturally loaded is that about how we choose our caregivers? And this mom's talking about, I'm like, wow, she's like going to the blackjack table with a bad boyfriend because it's really a gamble. And then because women will do like, well, if I have Dr. Johnson and Dr. Smith, there's a 50% chance, like, their boy, bad boyfriend behind door number one, you know, like that might be okay. But if I have those two over there, there is no way in heck I'm getting my V back, right? And so they're, they're walking into a, a situation where they know they're gambling with their empowerment. And we think this is okay. And like I said, I, I, all the time when I hear these stories, I feel like um, what I hear when women talk about their births, when they've been steered the wrong way and convinced that they have to have a cesarean birth when their body was not honored to enable them or empower them or educated perhaps in a way that they could push this baby out. I feel like I'm hearing stories about socially acceptable violence against women and children. And all of us who have had our hands on babies or have had to be that container for the birth story, we know that's how it feels to these moms. And we see some of the stuff that the babies have to deal with. You know, and I, I am a believer, love conquers all. We can undo this, and a mom's loving arms can absolutely undo this, but we need to help moms. That's what it's about for me. It's, it's the support, okay? So essentially, what are we doing? Through this model, we help a client turn over every stone so she can plan and later reflect on her birth in an empowered way. The more we know, the more stones we can turn over. That way, if a mom achieves her VBAC, she owns that power of creating her team, knowing her body, advocating for her care, and dancing her own birth dance. If she knows that her, she can have all of that too. If she knows that her cesarean birth was the best thing for her and her family, she should get the joy of all of that as well because she made really empowered decisions based on the context of what was going on in her birth. And I tell people all the time, we want your baby to come into this world in the gentlest way possible given the context of what's going on, okay? Because there are a lot of twists and turns in birth, okay? So here we help a mother stand in her power, and hopefully that translates into her power as a mother. Has anybody talked to a VBAC mom or maybe had a VBAC themselves? And they're like, whoa, that just changed the world. That was my experience. It radically changed. Yeah, yeah, I see a lot of head shaking. OK, so let's dig into this model. I like that quote. I'm going to let you read it while I can drink the water. I don't know who that lady is, but I like that quote. <laughs> so we're going to start with the paradigm of childbirth, and this has everything to do with her model of care. It does not necessarily have to do with what technology she will use. 
what it has to do with is the context within which her caregiver is working. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's not a predictor of are, do I have a cesarean birth or an epidural or narcotic. It's how does the caregiver that I am drawn to, how does the person view birth? Okay, this is where my girls who were the um, medical anthropologists helped me out. I'm grateful to them. Okay, so physiological uh, childbirth paradigm. This group, yeah, three midwifery groups put out this consensus statement. A normal physiological labor and birth is one that is powered by the innate human capacity of the woman and fetus. The birth is more likely to be safe and healthy because there is no unnecessary intervention that disrupts normal physiological processes. And this, you can download their, um, their whole, it's like a three or four page document that describes physiological birth. And that's a great thing to have available to clients um, when you're talking about feedback, um, if it feels appropriate. Okay, so characterized by spontaneous onset and progression of labor, normal physiological blood loss includes biological and physiological conditions that promote effective labor. That's where I come in, that's where you come in if you go into that birth setting and you help calm things down, give mom lots of good loving, get that oxytocin flowing. That's where we really fit in. It results in the vaginal birth of the infant and the placenta. It facilitates optimal newborn transition through skin, to skin contact and keeps mom and babe together. So of course that has ramifications for breastfeeding, right? And a granny healer I talked to about this model suggested like, oh yeah, and gut inoculation. That's not on this statement, but I thought, hmm, something to think about, gut, yeah, I'm there, okay. So the technocratic model of childbirth, whoops, wrong way, is the one that unfortunately most women are, uh, are, are familiar with in our culture, okay? It's that top-down approach. Authority and responsibility is inherent in the caregiver, in the practitioner, not in the patient. There is a mind-body separation. Diagnosis and treatment come from the outside in. There is a supervaluation of science and technology over like that physiological wisdom. There is an intolerance for other modalities. There is a standardization of care and there are profit-driven practices. Okay, that's like the worst of the worst of the bad list, right? So somewhere in on this continuum, anybody could possibly practice, right? So, the, so depending on where mom is in her power, is she comfortable with her inner authority or is she comfortable with an outer authority? She's going to be drawn one way or another. Does that make sense? Okay. Great, okay, so the childbirth paradigm that the mom chooses, and I had to do a quick change, I had to put those general practitioners in there this afternoon, it will affect her choice of caregiver and her choice of birth setting, and I put the gamut that I'm aware of, okay? So, um, you know, like I said, in my community, we have no general practitioners, we do have a community that does the unattended birth scene. Um, choice of birth setting, we don't have a birth center, so that's not an option in my town. But that's the childbirth paradigm is going to influence these decisions. And, you know, an obstetrician can absolutely be working within that physiological context, right? So it's not like, oh, this is on one end of the continuum and this is the other, okay? All right, so this is the point in the model where people are finding us, okay? It's our biological realities because they come to us because they have an ache or a pain or, oh, Melissa Larimer, you're, I heard you're a VBAC mom and you really like to work with moms who are planning VBACs. And um, a lot of times as we unwind the story and the ache or the pain that brings the mom to see us, it might be what kind of was the tissue restriction that led to the difficult birth that the childbirth paradigm did not support that led to the cesarean birth, right? So we have this 
whoo, 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 this thing going on here. So um, this one is so important to me because in 2003 I was in massage school and my sister Natalie was pregnant and she was like two months from delivering like right as I was getting in massage school so I could give her like this nice smooth out of tissues and you know and she felt good and it was great and she loved it and it was fun for us to do with as sisters but she had early rupture of membranes into the hospital early um, Pitocin, narcotic, epidural, cesarean over the course of 36 hours. And that's a really common story in my town. Is it a common story for all of you as well? Okay, that's always like the one where we go, oh, right? Okay, so then I went to Carol's. I came out here to Portland in um, 2012. And we did, you know, we, I did the maternal training. And then Natalie got pregnant again. And I got to go to her birth again and we both wanted it to look different and um, but I was there to support her and she would say to me like it would just be easier to schedule a cesarean birth I was like I know honey I know and we would have to go revisit that and I would have to be that uh, what did Allison can the compassionate Grace. yeah I'd have to like hold that for her and zip it right because it's her birth not mine and I had her get a doula instead of me, because I needed to be her sister and not her, her practitioner, or her service provider, or her birth team. I needed to love her. But I did get to work on her body. And what I remembered about Natalie after going to Carol's training was that when she was 19, she had like rolled a, her car in a ditch. She'd been thrown out of the car. She landed in a field. She broke both legs. She broke ribs. She broke an arm. She broke clavicle. And she was just full of scar tissue from going out the window. And she laid there for a couple of hours before anybody found her. And so I, instead of working on her as a prenatal client, I worked on her as a woman who had not received the proper healing after an awful accident that birth looked radically different, radically different. And so I was like, ooh, I'm a believer, right? Because those are the moments where like, it's some, you, you see the results very quickly. And so I've like taken that, I've ridden that wave in my practice, okay? So from a medical perspective, Natalie looked like she was all healed up. But when I put my hands on her with this different awareness and this different wisdom, I realized that her body had not been healed and treated and revered in a way to, pre to prepare it for like a physiological childbirth, okay? I'm looking around the room and I'm seeing people starting to spin a little bit. Take a deep breath, put your grounding cord into the earth, get to your center, okay? This is, we are tuned in women. We collectively hold the pain of women in our culture, okay? It's so important to know when we get into these tears, Whose are they? And we all know this, but sometimes you're holding the pain of the culture. And you're somebody who is going to work much more on a national arena than in a hometown arena. I'm kind of a hometown healer. That's what I want for myself. And that's why I bring this here, because I want you to take this as a launch pad and take it to your communities so that none of us have to think about healing the world. We just bring it right to our communities, because it's a big load to carry the world. Okay, so check in with your grounding cord and get yourself uh, to a place where you get to be exquisitely human. And we know that sometimes a client comes in and we're only one step ahead of them because we're dealing with our own stuff and that's all we have to be one step ahead of them to be that container and that's okay. All right, so here we look at the story of a woman's body and ask ourselves if it has been respected, treated, healed, and revered in a manner that is conducive to preparing it for the physiological paradigm of childbirth. And when we look at how we culturally use our bodies in, in these days, we're not preparing for physiological childbirth. And Lisa Gillespie is shaking her head. Yeah. Okay, so biological realities. When a mom comes in, we look at the overall health of the mama. 
We ask her how she's doing, and we want to know that the baby's okay, and then we like hit the birth story. All right, I want to hear about the previous birth story. This is what I want to hear about. I want to know if the cesarean birth was scheduled, was it an emergency, and what was the medical justification? She may not have all this information, but this is what I'm pulling, trying to pull out, okay? Was the birth induced or augmented? What was her pre-labor experience? And in that, I'm starting to visualize the, it, like the descent and rotation of the baby. I want to know what her experience of the pain was and when it was more intense during this process. Okay, maybe she didn't get to go into labor and I need to know that as well. How long was the labor? Were there times that she remembered that were particularly difficult? I want an indication of, of did she get the chance to like to to have you know have those oxytocin releases and get those receptors laid in her myometrium because if she did that's great and I know like she already has those receptors laid down in her myometrium for the second time around and and that's great that's good all right did she fully dilate did she get to push if so for how long. I want to know about the experience of the cesarean birth. What does she remember? How did the baby respond to birth? Nothing gets me more when a mom tells me she had an emergency cesarean, cesarean birth, and then I ask her, well, how did your baby respond? And they had a nine APGAR. And we've heard those stories, right? Okay, what was her healing and postpartum care like? Is there any indication of scarring? And what have her menstrual cycles been like since the birth? And how, have, and how did that compare to before the birth? Because what I'm looking for maybe is uterine position or some scarring, okay? And remember, when we have, um, you know, when we are battered, tissue's job is to protect organs. It's like one of the many purposes of tissue. But if her tissue has hardened around her uterus, I go into that tissue with a lot of reverence because I know that that body was creating a protection and support for that sacred organ. So I don't go in there with like, we're gonna bust this up. I am like, thank you for taking care of this sacred organ. And like, let's see what we can do to smooth it open so that you can have all of you, you know? So, and then we start to get into woo-woo stuff, but that's how I work. And I ask her about the position of the baby. Do you know what position your baby is in? And I like to ask that, uh, that question because it starts to give her the idea that she can be the authority on her body. She doesn't have to wait for somebody to tell her what her baby's doing. And we'll talk about, you know, punches and we'll talk about wiggles and we'll tickles and what all of this feels like from her experience and then with her hands on her babies and then I'll send her to the Spinning Babies website. That's my introduction to the Spinning Babies website and if you haven't done that, if you haven't been to one of those trainings or at least on the website, if you work with moms, it's one of the best things you can do for yourself is to get acquainted with that because then you can give her exercises to do where this and help her figure this out so then she is in charge of this. She's coming to you for support and that nudge and she goes home and she carries on the work on her own. That's really empowering to a mom. Okay, so that I'm looking at position of the baby and then of course we want to know how many babies are in there. I want to know the history of the pelvis and the uterus. I'm going to go over that really quickly because has everybody been to Carol's class on maternal Okay, so I'll go through the list of what the things that I'm looking for, and Carol's may be more extensive. Um, if you haven't been to that training, do it, do it, do it, all right? I want to know what that woman's body has lived, all right? I want to know about her menstrual cycles before her pregnancies. I want to know about birth control complications, endometriosis, PCOS, miscarriage, abortion, assault, abuse, sports accidents, car accidents, any injuries, any history of physical activity, and surgeries. 
if she's a runner and I feel restrictions in certain places of her body, I'm going to think about, okay, what has that progressive movement done to this woman's body over the years? And I'm not going to tell her she shouldn't run. Absolutely not. She, she should. But I'm putting that in my picture of what her body has lived. Okay? Obviously, we're going to do the cranial sacral thing. That's what we do. That's the tie that binds us, right? And the tissue re restrictions. I'm also, depending on the type of practitioner you are, I'm also an Arvigo practitioner. So I'm thinking about um, uterine position and innervation of the uterus. Uh, pel somebody might be looking at pelvic shape and alignment and size. Um, Somebody else might be looking, I'm looking at nervous system and endocrine function. Amniotic fluid's a big one now that the March of Dimes has come out and said no early, no, what, no requested, what, elective inductions, that's what it is. Um, and we're real savvy about that in town. Now all of a sudden we're having moms um, have their OBs are saying, you don't have very enough um, uh, amniotic fluid or you have too much amniotic fluid. And in my town that has replaced big baby, small pelvis. Okay. Yeah. So I know. <laughs> Bad, bad. Yeah, so it's good to know, you know, like what women are being told in your community. So you can be like, hmm, I feel like I have to stay on top of this. I have, a I have lots of conversations with birth workers who are like doulas and midwives and people who are in the hospital so that I can have that information so I can support those clients. Somebody else might be looking at like placenta and cord function. And one of the things I really like to know if the client knows it, what's her own birth story? Was she a cesarean birth herself? Was she induced? You know, what's her birth story? Because that's in her memory. Okay. And that is like a whole nother workshop. That's awesome. All right, cultural views. This is a big one. This is the area that we are going to work in the most, the biological reality and the cultural views, because we can't tell women who should be their caregivers. But I do need to know what they have to work with or against. But the cultural views, that's pretty huge. We can have an impact on that you know, and how we support. And it's not that we're trying to force women into a certain stance. It's that we're going to be, we're going to hear where she is in life. And we're going to support her and we're going to communicate with her like in the most empowering way possible so that she has, she expects good things for herself. Okay? So cultural views, how we view our bodies, use our bodies, and honor our bodies is cultural. And we have a whole tribe of people locally and nationally who are going to tell us what is beautiful and how we should feel about our bodies. Okay? Every community has its own birth culture. And I know I'm going to run out of time. But if I don't run out of time, ask me about the conscious living community where the mothers, the women in the community come in and sing during births. Um, as practitioners and healers, we're going to work within this paradigm, or within the biological and the cultural the most. All right. Here are some of the lovely dancing for birth women postpartum. Um, I know, right? Um, cultural view of the female body, what a woman holds for herself. And one of the things is, what's, what's, a good, what's a good woman? Does she agree with it? It gets defined within her family, within her community, nationally, right? What's in the, what's in the paper or what's, you know, what's drifting around there in the media? And her profession has a standard for what's a good woman. What's a good woman in my profession or to me is different than like the days when I worked in inpatient psychiatric care, right? Where does her sense of value come from? Does she fear not being enough? Or can she find the places where she is in her power? And what is her take on feminism? It's really interesting to me when people talk about feminism and birth. I'm like, well, tell me a little bit more about that. Because in the 60s and 70s, it was about like, get your goddess power going and embrace that birth. And in the 90s, we started to shift towards choice. And uh, the woman who wrote, um, deliver me from pain. She let, I can't think of her name, Jacqueline, I don't know, deliver me from pain. She says that she feels like once we started to talk about choice, 
it was beautiful. We were talking about choice so women didn't feel judged, but one of the backlashes of that was that we slid ourselves back into fear. I think that's a fascinating discussion for another day. But yeah, what does that mean? Okay, so here, I kind of broke down cultural views into four areas. So body image, we talk about this in Dancing for Birth all the stinking time. All the stinking time, okay? Body image. Does mom have a sense of celebration and joy in her body? Or does she view her body as something is broken? Or does she view her body as something that must be molded and controlled and put into a very pleasing package? Okay, those are two radically different ways to, to view our bodies, right? Does she expect her body to betray her? And that's a huge one because when we've had a cesarean birth, I'm going to speak from my experience. I'm not going to put this all on the rest of the world. In my experience of a cesarean birth, coming from a dance background with a body I could not control all the time, and eventually like I left my dance program, because I had this idea of what I needed to be. So in my view as a young woman, my body betrayed me. Okay, I couldn't make it what it needed to be. All right, and so then I have my cesarean birth and I'm just, my body betrayed me. It couldn't do what I was supposed to do. When in fact, culture betrayed me and my childbirth paradigm betrayed me. Okay, but that's the load that women bring into their births. My body doesn't work. And depending on what she's buying into culturally, she may think that's just her plight as a woman. Okay, because of what she compares herself to. Thank you so much. Okay, sexuality, creativity, and play. All right, does she have like a freedom to enjoy that? Does she allow herself to enjoy her body? Or is there a lot of guilt and shame with that? And these are all like second chakra aspects, right? Does she give herself room to be creative? Heck yeah, I dance. I don't have a flamenco dancer body, but I love to flamenco dance and I love to belly dance. So I enjoy that, right? I like, I'm not an artist, but I like to knit, you know? So do we give ourselves this permission to create and play? How many of you, uh, you know, sometimes say like, I want to do this, but I don't have time. And then you take the time to do it, and then you just feel guilty. That's part of that cultural view. And then empowerment, okay? Empowerment may be, you know, what is valued in her community. Like, what's a strong woman in her eyes? Where is she with her own strength and competence? Is she comfortable with her intuition? Or is intuition something that in her tribe gets shut down? Okay? Um, does, she, does she respond to an inner authority? Or does she respond to an outer authority? And that outer authority may be her partner. It could be her own mother. It could be her friends. It could be her caregiver. It could be establishments. Okay? Is she aware of her own needs? All the time I hear women say, I want to have a birth here, but I don't think my husband will let me. You know? Or I want to have a birth here, but... Um, you know, my mom and dad just won't support that. And, you know, th this is loaded. This is loaded. Inner authority or outer authority. Can she ask for help and then graciously receive it? Is she a caretaker, a people pleaser, or even a martyr? Okay? Those are things that get rewarded in our culture for women. Okay? Relating to other women, what I find is the way that women relate to other women is the way they relate to themselves, okay? Um, is there room for self-care if she's in service? And we all are, right? We're all in service. Is that balanced service? Does she tend to criticize and compete with other women? Or does she accept and reciprocate and celebrate support? Okay, it's a hard one for moms to ask for help. We're living in the if I just try harder culture. Okay, is she a perfectionist or is there grace and flexibility in her life? You know, being a flexible person takes a certain amount of grace. All right, we can't, ugh. we can't talk about uh, VBAC without talking about the death card. 
Within these views, members of the community may be insulated or hidden from rites of passage or life events, or they may involve community support and celebration. And where I'm going with this is how did her, you know, if, if a baby is lost through miscarriage or if there's a stillborn baby, how is that responded to in her community? You know, if she herself has had experienced a loss, what was the support she got way back when or in the recent past, okay? How did people respond to her cesarean birth? You know, and this is the common one. Well, at least you got a healthy baby because you're telling me something really uncomfortable and I want to say something really good to you. And I'm like, no, you know, I didn't say this at the time, but in hindsight, it's like, you didn't hand me a healthy baby. You handed me a live baby. And I had to make that baby healthy. So from the medical perspective, my baby was a healthy baby. But when I have a baby that doesn't want to breastfeed, can't regulate, is shut down, has trouble pooping, has trouble passing gas, don't you dare tell me I got a healthy baby. That is unkind, okay? And what's the commitment and motivation for VBAC? All right, there's a lot of different reasons to have a VBAC. One of them is that my mother's group really gave me a lot of grief for not having, planning a VBAC, and I just really want to schedule my cesarean. That's not a good reason to have a VBAC. And that's not a very healthy mother's group, if you ask me, okay? <laughs> and so when I hear somebody say, like, it would just be easier to plan the cesarean birth, I'm like, I'm with you, sister, tell me about it. What's that mean for you? Because I want to help her start turning, turning over those stones. And she can decide, is that a stone that I can toss aside? Or is that like one that um, it's just in the path and I'm going to have to hurdle right over it? Or maybe I don't want to hurdle over it at all. That's her business. That's not my business. But I will ask her to start turning over stones. Tell me about that. OK, my motivation was a lot of anger for my second home birth. And the anger came from um, like, wow, I was steered wrong, and I thought things were going to go down a certain way, and I don't want that again for my baby. I want a healthy baby. I don't want a lie, just a live baby. I want, I want a vibrant baby because that's what I've grown. And so there was a lot of anger that propelled me through that first home birth. Um, uh, VBAC, and I keep saying home birth like because that was my experience at that time. Like I said, that was the only way you were going to get a, a, cesare or a, a VBAC in my community in the late 90s. So that was my experience. Lots of good things can happen in hospital and birth center births, of course, right? So the second time I'm at home and I'm like about halfway through labor and I'm like leaning over, I'm like, this is stupid. I have nothing to prove. What am I doing? And I got this little ping. I'm doing it for love. Oh, for love. Okay. I can get through this labor. And that carried me the rest of the way. So I had two different motivations. Same mom, same birth setting, two different motivations. Okay. So we have to ask, you know, like, what do you want? Okay. There's this great quote on the back. Um, number four, this speaks to the death card because that's the one that gets played. Women kind of get talked out or talk themselves out of, of, of VBAC because, um, you know, that's our ultimate fear, right? I felt relieved when they told me I would have my cesarean. I labored for the last four hours, believing my baby was dead while everyone else slept. All I could think about was that my mother-in-law had given birth to a stillborn baby when my husband was little. Okay, so that mom was carrying the family history that maybe had not been acknowledged and processed into her birth. And she's a healer type of a woman, so it didn't surprise me at all. I got to be a part of her second birth. Um, and I asked her, you know, I, I called her up and I asked her, I'm in the back of my car, or I'm in my car at, in the Target parking lot, and we're like just laughing hysterically. I was like, well, tell me what, you know, where were you with your, with your, um, your, your, your second birth and your VBAC? And she was like, I was balls to the wall that I was going to have, <laughs> have this, um, to have this VBAC and she was just like she came at that experience with such force. She was like I had a plan for everybody on my team. I was willing to kick them to the curb if they weren't supporting that and I was in charge. I knew I needed support but I wanted the right support. Okay. 
All right, so we ask about fears and concerns. We help our clients name them. And then we help them tap into resources that can help maybe switch their view of cultural support, what they deserve to get. All right, so how a community views VBAC will depend on, or how what a mom has available for VBAC will depend on the community's view of VBAC. Okay, so like there's a, um, there's a community hospital in Los Angeles. They have a 70% or 71% cesarean birth rate. I, this is a rabbit hole to get on cesareanrate.com to look at what different, you know, is going on in different towns. I can only assume, you know, as I'm looking through different towns and what I know about different cities and different areas, that poverty and lack of education have a lot to do with what's available to women in terms of choices. Okay, beautiful, beautiful quote from a mom, number six, I was educated, I knew my rights as a patient and my rights as a human. I determined my own care. What are other women supposed to do? I was surrounded by the people who believed in me 110%, okay? She was educated about her choices. She knew what was available to her. That was huge. She had her V back, by the way, and it was beautiful. Okay, all right, so is there any chance, I've only got 10 minutes left. What I wanna do is I'm going to, we're going over we, started. we started over, okay, okay. 10 minutes and 10 minutes. If anybody has to leave, like I'm not offended, I totally understand if you have plans and you need to zip out, so yeah. Don't sweat it. Um, but what I do want to do is we're going to like we're going to plug into this model, and I want the microphone up here, and we're going to we're going to popcorn this microphone around. I'm going to be your client, and I want you to start plugging into the model. Okay, so everybody should be able to hear something. I'm going to pretend like I'm giving you my yeah to pass, wherever we can. Yeah, just hand it off to the first person, I guess, when the time comes. Okay, I'm going to tell, I'm going to give an example. So, um, I'm going to tell you, okay, so the mom who said, um, I had a posterior uh, labor, you're going to go, oh, biological realities, and they gave me Pitocin childbirth paradigm, okay? So we're, you're gonna be assessing this, like I'm gonna pretend I'm your client, I'm giving you to the best of my ability, my sec, like my pregnancy the second time around so that it's a real deal, and then let's pretend that I'm coming into you for a session, all right? And what I find, if moms have, if they're solid on two out of three of these aspects, they can override the third. The third just doesn't even matter. And I am consistently finding that. So if you find out the same thing, if you use this, let me know, because we might be onto something really hot, right? Okay. <laughs> Two out of three ain't bad. That's good enough. You know, we have this myth that this mom has to be fully whole and actualized and healed before she can have her V back. That's not gonna happen. I had like a baby in 1995 and I had home birth V backs in 98 and 99 and it wasn't until 2004 before I put all the demons to rest about my, because it was a long process and what that looked like for me, it was nine years of being overprotective and controlling with my kids because of the high anxiety. And I, um, that's now, those aren't demons anymore. Those are irritations to my husband. Like, <laughs> but they were demons. They were anxiety, okay? So here I go. All right. Let's start with this group of women first. You're going to plug into the, to the model first. Is that okay? All right. So I'm going to, we'll see if my demons are still here. I might cry a little bit. So I'm 28 years old. Two years ago, I had a C-section. I don't think Nicholas was born in my due date because my doctors kept moving up my due date because they said I was measuring big. 
If we stuck with the original due date, Nick would have been born about 38 to 39 weeks. I was leaking something and I wasn't sure if it was the amniotic fluid or urine and one of the new female doctors said to get myself to the hospital right away and I was so excited because I didn't really enjoy being pregnant and I just really wanted my baby and I was impatient with late pregnancy and Preston and I really, really wanted this baby. We waited five years to have this baby so that we could get through college and get our careers started. Okay, I was really tired because I was working full time and so I was grateful they said go to the hospital because I was tired of working in patient psych. I was so tired, what I did was I would come home at four o'clock and I would lay down in the recliner and I would sleep until seven o'clock and I would get up and eat and I would go back to bed at the end of my pregnancy. Okay, for some reason I decided that I would go to one of the female physicians in my practice and I asked her what can I do to avoid a cesarean birth and she said don't gain so much weight. Okay, I expected more from the woman in the practice. That's what I bring to you my first session. What do you hear? Plug into the model. We don't have to get it all. What did you hear and where would you put it in the model? Childbirth, Childbirth paradigm. What was it about the childbirth paradigm? Your doctors saying that too heavy that was Yeah, that's what got you cesarean. Okay? All my fault. Okay. I also heard the biological realities too uh, about your gestation and, and, and all that. So there's that middle area. Yep, that middle area. And also the exhaustion is a biological reality for you. Yeah. What was I eating? Yeah. Okay, biological reality, I'm tired. What else? Any cultural realities? Okay, Molly's shaking her head and listen. Do you have? I don't think I remember, but I think it's got something about your view of being pregnant. I didn't like being pregnant. Yeah, you said that. I didn't like being pregnant. Yeah, I didn't like being pregnant. What's that about? Okay, Molly, you, did you have one that was different? I just, you shook your head, so I thought. I thought when you were talking about getting your careers in order and all of that, that's really cultural views too. That's you know, really family cultural. Family and like getting anxious about when the baby arrives. Awesome. Pass it on. Let's just keep it going. Let's break it down. You thought that the female doctor would be a better source of information. Yeah. I was looking for my wise woman, right? I didn't have my inner wise woman going on. I was looking to somebody else. And again, culturally, there's a female doctor who's compassion. She's a doctor first. Yes. Right? Okay, I've got one more and we're going to move on to like my next visit, okay? I went home and I lay, I sat, I laid in a recliner for three hours. What's that doing to my hips and my, yeah, my pelvis, right? Okay, so here's the story. You're like, hmm, I wonder if that mom had a posterior baby, you know? Two inch heels. <laughs> yeah, no, I can guarantee you I was not wearing two inch heels. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to tell you more about my birth story. So I got to the hospital, the advice of doctor number one, and doctor number two comes in after 12 hours. And we'd only seen him once, and he puts me on Pitocin because nothing was happening. When the whole thing just like snowballed from there, Pitocin, narcotic, epidural, my, they broke my water. I pushed for 90 minutes, and then they put me on oxygen, and I lost it. I felt so trapped. I could not get my head into a calm space, and when I started to freak out, out, that's when they pulled out the, the papers for the cesarean birth. Okay? I don't remember much between the oxygen mask and getting into the operating room. And I remember Nicholas being born, and I know I had him two hours after. That's all I remember. Okay. I was going to say the biological reality of an oxygen mask on your face is very frightening. Yes. Okay. And, and who's responsible for that choice? Right. Okay. For that decision. I just wanted to say I heard all three because of, I just saw a shoot, you know, down the shoot of intervention. It just starts one after another and starts cascading slope okay. slope. So they were all. It was a it was a childbirth paradigm mm -hmm. that it needs to be managed that way. But then it's a biological reality because then you just start adding intervention after intervention. Yeah. So it's like, all of that is part of our yeah. cultural view that we yeah. need to manage. 
to care that way and that we're that cut off from the process of birth itself. Allison. I just want to say that I, I think there's another category that you might want to awesome. add. Awesome. And that's why we're here. We're going to pump this baby up, right? I think <laughs> we need to add a circle called psychosocial realities. Psychosocial realities. I love it. I love it. Well, the psychosocial piece is the is the psychosocial piece where your your the fear and the dissociation that occurred when you had the oxygen mask on, mm -hmm. you're dissociated from there on in. Okay. Oh, keep going. Yeah. yeah. And so that's a psychosocial reality. Okay. Is it by, okay, so here's my question. Let's flesh this out. So remember at the beginning I said, so the mom's emotional and spiritual stuff is happening inside this perimeter, this container. What do you think? Where does, like, does that cover that, or do we need another circle on here? You think another circle. Maybe this is a place for her responses. A place for her responses? Okay. She's responding All right, I'm taking notes, and this is an ongoing conversation, okay? Anybody else? I was just gonna say, when you made the comment, you were told nothing was happening, how, you know, we have the childbirth paradigm of how we measure whether or not something is happening. Of course something was happening. Right, But we right. put that label on it, and all of a sudden the mother is a failure because her body's not doing what it needs to be doing. Right, right, and so at Carol's training, she said, well maybe, who was it? Yeah, somebody, some, some training I have been to said like, well, if we don't know about dilation, like maybe nothing seem, appears to be happening with dilation, can we get some feedback from the mom about rotation or station? Because those things are happening. Dilation is not the, the marker for progress. Yeah, can we get that pass back there? So would it be useful to have the whiteboard near you, or no? Um, I'm taking notes here. I don't know that I can handle the whiteboard, <laughs> too. If somebody else wants to take, you know, be whiteboard goddess, that's fine. I'm like right at 5 o'clock. Is everybody good? Okay. Uh, I think it's been touched upon but hasn't been spoken about, which is the part where you gave your power up yes. to the people around you yeah. instead of taking it to yourself. Right. So that's the cultural view, right? But it's with the psychosocial implications. Well, it's both. It's both. Like, I think it starts to bounce all together because I was raised with a sense of outer authority due to my religious upbringing, due to my educational upbringing. And so then I start to swallow that view, and then it becomes my mental reality, right? Whereas for me and my birds, there was nobody who was going to tell me what to do. Yeah, there you go. Different lens, right? Okay, so we're going to progress through this, all right, because it starts to change. All right, so now I'm going to come to you, and I'm 34 weeks, and I'm early in my pregnancy. I asked one of the doctors in my, oh, we, we did that, never mind. I taught, okay, let's see here. I talked to my neighbor, who is a VBAC mom, and she told me to go to a childbirth education class bought by midwives and doulas. So I went trying to get a better idea of what went wrong. We somehow showed up an hour early to class, and I just sobbed in the car because I thought we had the wrong day and the wrong time, and I realized that was my first clearing of realizing how important it was that I had to figure this out. I knew I was not going to get my VBAC unless I figured out what went wrong? What do you hear in that? And let's just take three. I think the first thing was the lack of trust you had in yourself. The first thing yes. you did was question right. whether you got the information right. Absolutely. And you didn't trust yourself. Yeah. Absolutely. This is common in women. This is very common. I think it's, a, it, it's not an unusual scenario for a young woman. Absolutely not. Yeah, okay, next one. I would say the, the cultural view. Uh, I was an emergency room nurse for a long time, and when you would do a sexual assault, it was a young woman's fault. And so there's that cultural view that it's our fault. It's like, right, right. I would actually put that partially in the top of the 
Okay. Because as when I was going to my VBAC, yeah. it was like the homework period of like, I had to figure out what I did wrong last time, so I did it right this time, so everybody would hear things I'm okay. Right, right. So for me, it wasn't until I owned my 50% of the responsibility in the physician-patient relationship, that's when I started to find my way out of the rabbit hole. And I could start planning my VBAC was when I could like start, when I started to own my 50% of that relationship. It was huge for me. All right? so. Here's my next visit. We just finished up classes, but one of the doulas told us that we had to get our medical chart from the hospital so we could look at it from the physician's perspective of what went wrong. And she said that that's my hospital chart. I get to have it. March yourself into the hospital and get your chart. March yourself into the obstetrician's office and get your chart. And I was blown away that I could do that, okay? When I read it, I was surprised because the documentation of my birth was so cold and detached. Okay. One of the classes was taught by a midwife and my husband and I went out for dinner after class. We decided we wanted her hands to be the first hands to touch our baby. We wanted a person who believed in birth and a person with love and integrity in our birth space. And after we learned more about birth and why our birth went south the first time, we realized that I needed time to get into labor on my own terms. I know that I am strong enough to do this because one of the midwives asked me if I had Pitocin and how long I labored with the Pitocin before we had any drugs and I was so worried I wasn't strong enough to handle a vaginal birth. And she was a Muslim midwife who lived under the veil and she had a coarse manner about her and very stern eyes and she looked at me and when I told her I labored for eight hours on Pitocin and she said, you're so strong, you can handle anything, <laughs> right? And when I saw her eyes and I heard her voice, I knew she believed in me, and I started to believe in myself, okay? Plug it in. The first thing I heard was the childbirth paradigm. I want this woman to be one whose hands are the first to touch my child, rather than, yes. oh. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it didn't occur to me. I knew I wanted loving hands. That was radical, to think that I needed to have a long-term relation with the person, relationship and love with a person who was the first person to touch my baby. I think it's a, probably very, uh, something we take for granted as a cultural view, that our own records are not ours. Okay. I thought that was really yeah. Anything else? I feel like we could go on and on and on with this, right? So one thing I'm going to say, and we're going to go on to the next one, is I found my wise woman. Remember, I was like a young woman who, didn't, who was not her inner authority, and I was looking for a wise woman to show me the way, and this Muslim midwife with her eyes and her voice and her confidence in the body of women and, the con and, and, and sh pu pushed that my way, I all of a sudden became a believable person in this world in my strength. Okay, I found my wise woman, okay? And she didn't tell me how to do it. She just gave me some feedback. Wow, Pitocin's really hard. You kind of rocked it. You did eight hours. Good for you. Okay, so we did, t we had to do deep soul searching about a home birth, though, because my niece Renee died when she was 18 months old, and I don't know how my sister survived that, and I didn't realize I had brought that fear into my own birth, which is why I chose the doctors. Allison, what do you want to say? definitely have such a heavy uh, weaving in of the psychosocial okay. in there, right? So I really do encourage you to add that in there. Okay. Yeah. Great. And you'll talk, you're going to talk to me about that, right? Yes, I will. Awesome, <laughs> sister. Great. Yeah. This is why I need to, to bring this today, okay? So that we can get this 
something that's workable. I think we've already got something that's workable just in terms of assessment. Okay, I'm gonna do like one last little thing. I'm just gonna give you this story because we don't really have time to like plug it in. We did the research about rupture and I am just not scared about that for some reason. I just don't worry about being that small percent. If I worried about odds like that, I just wouldn't leave the house each day. I'm anxious though, and my midwife is newer and she's busy, so her mentor is also attending our birth. It is interesting, one of them makes me feel safe because of all of her experience, and the other feeds my soul because she is so calm and loving. I'm not having anyone but my husband and midwives at the birth because I know I need to focus. It will be hard to send Nick to my sister-in-law's house, but she is so sweet and he loves her so much. I'm afraid if he's here, I won't be able to focus on the birth. And I know I'm so scared I have to have all my attention on this birth. Okay? Um, I'm a little scared, but we decided not to tell most of our family about the home birth. They're going to project all of their anxiety onto me, and I won't be able to find my way if I'm dealing with that. Okay, I just can't tell them. My sister and my sister-in-law know, and that's it. Every night, Preston has been putting Nick to bed, and I light the same green candle. I have been reading Jane Austen books because they have nothing to do with anything that I'm anxious about right now. <laughs> and when I feel calm, I put my hand on my belly and I ask my baby, do you, is it okay to be born at home? And every night he says yes. And if, if one night comes and he says no, I'll change my mind. So we made this decision to have this home birth plan for this home birth VBAC, like when I was like 36 weeks pregnant. So like for a woman who like had no inner authority to like toss her bad boyfriends to the curb was really big, was really big. And so what I like about, um, you know, I have to be honest, this is really hard to share with you. But to get through this model, I wouldn't dare ask another woman to open her heart so that we could dissect it. So thanks for being gentle in that and giving, you know, I'm really plugging into the model and I'm really anxious to see what Allison and I get to talk about. And anyone else, you have my email on here. Um, hopefully this will evolve into something bigger and very usable down the road. Um, how I have used this to shape my practice so far, um, I really look at what women are buying into and choosing through their Dancing for Birth classes and how I shape my massage practice. Um, I encourage women to own their health and daily drop, in, and drop into their bodies. I give them exercises to do after they leave if it's appropriate. We talk about body inquiry, which was my experience with my baby. We connect, I connect with a baby. I talk to the baby, woo woo. Um, couples coaching, right? <laughs> couples coaching, see how the, um, see how the um, partner interacts with the mom and how he can support or she can support and does that mom receive support appropriately and with an open heart or are her barriers up. I go to massage in early labor and other points during the birth where appropriate. Um, I discuss self-care after birth. I want us to do a better job with helping women get their bodies back um, to a place where they can be prepared for a physiological next birth or for physiological menopause, which I'm not even sure we know what it looks like. And also I'm thinking about taking this into some advanced doula trainings because they are on the front lines. Doulas get me a lot of clients. And if I can get them to like look at this in the same way, we're gonna get more moms getting more support and dealing with the biological realities. That's where we can, we can work it. And then last but not least, where can you use the model? You could take this today and it's just gonna change the way you you assess your clients maybe okay um, great discussion that's gonna go on I know in my uh, apartment tonight um, <laughs> self-reflection what if you're dealing with your own wounds Okay, it might be a great thing to reflect on. We can do education. You could use this paradigm for your work. So like, so let's say you're passionate about tongue tie. We're gonna have some biological realities. We're gonna have a mom who's drawn to a certain paradigm for care. And then we're gonna have her cultural views about 
mothering. So I think that even if you didn't want to look at this with VBAC, you could take it what your passion in it is in and you could plug it in in this way. Maybe, I think that's possible. And um, yeah, thank you.